what in the world is going on? I think we're finding out uh, that we're asking this question even more and more and more. And uh, so I just want to cover a few things today that'll point you to some scriptures, so it'll point you to some, uh, to some excitement, I think, that'll help you. And so we're going to see a few things that the Lord uh, prophesied about um, many, many, many years ago. Uh, 329 scriptures in the Bible talk about Jesus' second coming. It's, it's eight times more talked about than Jesus' first coming. And Jesus' first coming was talked about, that he was going to come, he was going to uh, be as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and that he would, he would rise again. Lots of scriptures, but there's eight times more scriptures about Jesus' second coming than his first. So the Lord wanted us to know about this season, this time, and he wanted us to be hopeful and not sad. You guys okay? He wanted us to be hopeful and not sad. And, and the beauty of this is, and I, I'm going to say it over and over again, we believe in the rapture of the church. We believe in Jesus coming back for us. And it's not an escapism mentality. We're not trying to escape the world, even though we are. It's a hustle theology. It's a hurry up and get it done. It's an excitement theology so that we can see what's coming. And even though the world gets darker, we can still smile when we're at Walmart. Right? I mean, we can still have joy in our life. Why? Because this is not the end. This isn't it. This is just the beginning for us, right? And this hope and this joy and this excitement that comes on the inside of us really shines out of us and people want to latch onto that. They want a piece of that. Come on, it brings a whole new meaning. Come on, you want a piece of me? It brings a whole new meaning to that. People do, they want, they want what you have when you're excited, joyful, happy. Come on, it, it, if you're happy and people don't know it, could you do us a favor and inform your face? Because this is what the world needs, right? I mean, somebody's got to be happy on aisle three. Somebody. Amen. So he's told us some things so we can be excited about what he's about to do for us. Last week, we spent some time talking about signs in the heavens, about the blood moons, that, that he has placed things, stars moving, and, and the blood moon eclipses. He placed these in the heavens to show us that Israel becoming a nation was an absolute critical event in 1948 that that generation will not pass away till all is fulfilled. That means we're at the end. Amen. We saw that Israel becoming a nation was a big part of the, uh, what plays out on the world stage. You know, the, there are tons of prophecies in the Old Testament and some that are referred to in the New that couldn't even come to pass until Israel became a nation. There's, there's, it's talk of people coming against the nation of Israel. And Israel was not a nation for a very long stretch. So you, they could not have been fulfilled until Israel came back into statehood, right? So 48 is a big deal. It means that we can start looking at the Ezekiel prophecies and go, this is, this is happening in our lifetime. This is happening in our lifetime because Israel's now on the world stage again. Amen. We saw that there were 6,000 years of human history that we're at the very end of. The six days of creation, right? The verse that says a day is as a thousand years with the Lord as a thousand years is a day, right? And, and we're at the end of this 6,000 years of how the Bible lays out creation. We're coming here to the end of the church age, the end of the era, and Jesus is gonna come back. We're gonna step over into that seventh year of rest for those that love him, amen? amen. We're there, we're close. So we spent some time talking about prophetic fulfillments about Israel, about Jerusalem uh, becoming uh, the, the capital again of Israel, the explosion of knowledge and travel. This is all last week. If you didn't hear it, it's on YouTube. <laughs> the explosion of knowledge and travel and how that was prophesied, what that's gonna look, we're seeing it. We talked even a little bit about AI and how I think, I think AI is one of those things that is just speeding up the timeline. When you, when you pay attention to the people that understand AI and how it can become sentient, it can come, become self-aware, there are, there are quite a few things about AI that I believe are actually gonna help the Antichrist rule the world. Uh, I'll read you a few headlines um, that I think are very interesting, uh, just where we're at today. Uh, and then we're gonna turn over to Ezekiel. So if you wanna find that spot, Ezekiel 38. Uh, headlines. Just, just in the last few weeks, Eastern Libya authorities say 2,000 dead in a flood, thousands missing. Eastern Libya had a massive rainstorm and they had several, not one, but several dams break and cataclysmic water just washed. They don't even know the, they don't even know the count yet because they were washed out to sea, thousands. The Bible talks about weather events 
in the end, right? Uh, Morocco earthquake, uh, race against time to reach survivals as number killed uh, nears 2,900. And then not too long ago, we had that earthquake in Turkey that was thousands and thousands of people. Are you guys paying attention to any of the world stuff? Stuff the Bible talks about. Um, here's, a, here's an AI headline that I saw. 90% of online content may be AI generated by 2026. 90% of content may be AI generated by 2026. Remember last week we talked a little bit about artificial intelligence and how it's gonna give uh, uh, way to mass in disinformation, mass dim- disinformation. Like they can fake videos, they can fake pictures, they can, they can do a lot of different things where it's gonna deceive the world. They're gonna think they're seeing something real and it's AI generated. Are you guys listening to me? This just tells me that Jesus is close. Because, and I joked about this last week, but this world is not gonna turn into a Terminator series. We are not gonna turn into the seventh movie of the series. It's not gonna happen. Jesus is coming back. But there there are things heading this direction that lead us to believe, put us in position to understand God is not gonna let this whole thing just cataclysmically go into nuclear winter, the whole world. It's not gonna happen until we're out of here. That I believe there are gonna be, there are gonna be nuclear explosions in the tribulation period. The way the Bible describes things, it's, it's pretty apparent. I don't believe we're gonna see nuclear winter in our lifetime. Are you guys okay? That's good news, right? So we're paying attention to the signs. We're paying attention to the signals. Uh, the, EU, the, the EU, the European Union says this must be ready for new members by 2030. So they're making adjustments in their plans to bring in more nations into the European Union. Why? It's all prophetic. The Roman Empire rekindled, the, the, that, whole, that whole thing, that whole scene, right, is, is centered around these European countries and the EU is making way for this to happen. This is just this is headlines, just in the last couple of weeks. We gotta make way to bring in a whole bunch of new nations by 2030. Uh, here's another one. Kremlin threatens to use nuclear weapons, right? This the threatening of it, the, the, the threatening of it, right? I mean, they're out there. There's lots of headlines, lots of things going on in our world. Not to scare us, but just for us to pay attention. We're close. Amen. Amen. So turn over to Ezekiel and we'll look a little bit at what uh, Ezekiel has to say, the prophet. We know we're in the end times because Israel became a nation. We know we're there because uh, there are prophecies in the Bible that talk about Israel being a nation again at the end. So this is a big deal. And so that, them becoming a nation in 48, set us up. So in, in Ezekiel 38, I just wanna read uh, a few verses in here so you can see some things um, that fit current events. So Ezekiel 38, verse one. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face against Gog, that's a person, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. Rosh is Russia, okay? Not a huge leap there, but that's geographically, that's it. So he's saying, set your face against Gog in the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. So Magog's bigger than Russia. It incorporates other things, but he's the prince of Rosh. Uh, Meshech and Tubal and prophesy against him. Now, do we have that, um, we have that picture of the, the biblical names map? Do we have that somewhere? We'll pull that up. Um, so this gives you a picture of a little bit. So Magog, you see Magog is over on the right side in the brown. And it's, it's all the stands, the Kazakhstan, the Uzbekistan, the Kyrgyzstan, the Turkmenistan, the Afghanistan, all those, right? You see that? And then Rosh is red, which comes over the top of that. So you can see how the Gog, Gog is, you know, of Magog and the Prince of Rosh. He's, he controls, Putin controls Rosh and then over into that area, not all of it into the stands, but up there in the Northern part. And they have, they have agreements with these countries too. So this is, what, this is some of the area that this Bible verse is talking about. And it says, prophesy against him, verse three, and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog of the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses, horsemen, all splendidly clothed in great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them all of them with shield and helmet. Now, Persia is Iran, modern day Iran. Iran and Russia are working together consistently. They are exchange of ideas. They're exchange of scientists. They're exchange of armament and weaponry. They they have been doing this incognito and out front for quite a while. So he's 
this, this, is, this is lining up, this is fitting. The, uh, Iran would not be as far with, with weaponizing uh, uranium as they would have been had Russian scientists not been there to help them. Are you following me? So they're, they're in cahoots. You guys know that term, cahoots? That's old, that's old. They're, they're in on it together, right? Like some people are like, what's cahoots? That's, a, that's not even on the map. It isn't, okay. <laughs> so, so Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them. These are other alliances that are, that are happening with Russia. Uh, Gomer and all its troops, the house of uh, Togmar, to, Togamar, and from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. So there's another, throw that map up again. There's another set of people where it's listing in this. So you've got uh, Gomer, which is, um, and, and to, Togarma. This is new to me. So it's, you know, it's hard to say. It's, that's Turkey, right? That's Turkey and some of Levant and Syria. And those guys, uh, they're not real fond of Israel either. And so they're, they're working together. Uh, Ethiopia, you know, southern, the southern part of Egypt and, in, and into actual Ethiopia. Then Libya, right? Put, these, these nations are nations that aren't happy with Israel having that. I mean, you can't even see it from where you're sitting. That little tiny sliver, the, the, the little tiny piece, right? They have, all, they have everything else. They want that piece. Why is there such a fight over this little tiny piece of land? It's because it's God's promised land and his borders are listed in the book. And he said, this is gonna be my people's land, right? This is why the enemy's fighting for it. He's trying to overthrow God's plans. This verse is telling us that the players are on the stage. They're already in place to do everything that he says is gonna happen here in the next few verses. Verse seven says, prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited. Uh, in the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel. He's saying after a, after a length of time, they're gonna come back against the people of Israel who were gathered back, who were separated and brought away by sword. They were gathered back to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. So they're, the Israel, Israel, by and large, is a very safe country to live in. They have incredible security incredible protection mechanisms. There are things that are happening, but they get on it right now. They would never, never allow a border crisis like we have on our Southern border, ever, ever, right? Ever, I mean, nations that handle their business have walls and fences and gates and ports, right? You guys okay? So they're very well protected and they are, they, when I was there, there were missiles even being fired and there was just this sense of calm and peace. It was just amazing. They're dwelling securely in their land. So he says this, you will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. So he's saying all these nations, Gog, Magog, Rosh, Tubal, all, all these nations are gonna come down like a cloud. They're gonna swarm over the hills back down toward Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan and you will say, I will go up against the land of the unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and, ha and having neither bars nor gates to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. They have evil in their hearts because they want the resources of Israel. And Israel is thriving right now. They have, they have a... a an absolute immense agricultural system in what was a desert just 40 years ago. Why? They figured out how to irrigate, they figured out how to fertilize, and they are growing some incredible crops in the nation of Israel. That little tiny sliver is incredibly fruitful. Why? The hand of God is on them, right? The anointing of God is on, it's his people. He's given them wisdom and innovation and ideas, and I'm telling you, they're God ideas, and this place is, is blooming in the desert. And all around them, not so much. So you can imagine the envy and the thought right here, the evil plan, the thoughts of their heart. We're gonna go in there and get that. They figured out how to do it. We're gonna get it. We're gonna use it for ours and we're gonna take theirs. That's what's happening. Take plunder, take all this stuff. Sheba and Dan, I wanna make sure. <clears throat> Sheba and Dan and the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take this booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods and take great plunder? The other thing that they're coming after, and this is worth noting, is that uh, 
Israel found in two locations off their coast, I believe it's two sites off their coast, they found a total of 32 trillion, trillion, 32 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. It's the largest deposit anyone's ever found in the country or in the world, ever, in the world, ever. You can imagine why this would be something desirable to a nation outside, right? I mean, with the sanctions on Russia and the Nord Stream pipeline being shut down and all these other things, like they're, they're selling energy to China, they're selling energy to Iran, they're, they're making up the difference. But if they get access by force to 32 trillion cubic feet, it, in, from the naturally speaking, that sets Russia up forever. Are you with me? So the th this is the thinking process. It's not just we're gonna go down and wipe out God's people. That, they're not thinking we're gonna have to fight against God, against God. Maybe we should read Ezekiel 38 first. This doesn't look good. Maybe we shouldn't. They're not doing this. It's all economic. It's all spiritually motivated going after the people of Israel. Are you following? Yeah. So you can see why they would do this. You can see that when, when the world gets tight and it gets, and it gets difficult and it gets hard and Israel's doing really good, you know, maybe we should go down there and have theirs. We're gonna take plunder, right? That's what it means. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say, God, thus says the Lord, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north. It says it again, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. And you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. And it will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me. And when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes, thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days? My servant, the prophets of Israel who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them. Now I wanna keep reading because it's gonna tell us what happens right here in verse 18. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken surely in that day, there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So that the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall and every, every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So this, this prophecy is showing us the players on the stage that are already in position, that are actually making alliances as we speak, even more so firming those things up, moving munitions, moving armor, armament, moving people into position to, to go after Israel, to make up the difference for the absolute cost that this Russian war is costing Russia. This, this, the money that, that Iran needs to do what they wanna do, even though we, can, we keep giving them money, dear Jesus, can that please stop, right? But they, they're, they're coming down after these resources so that they can, they can go after the nation of Israel. And God said, when that happens, he's gonna rain down hailstones and fire and brimstone and wipe them out. And then there's gonna be this cleanup crew that other scriptures point to, the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, and they're gonna come and clean up the mess that happens after it's all done. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the more we see these nations get into place and, and, and get into cahoots, do you like that? Get into cahoots together, right? The more we see this, the, more, the closer we're getting. Because this, this battle right here happens right at when we're leaving, like just before or just after we're leaving, right? just after the rapture of the church. We, we, we will see either the beginnings of it or not see it at all except see it from heaven. This first battle, it's a beginning of the mess that starts in the Middle East where the Antichrist rises up and has peace for three and a half years after this wipeout. And then, and then the great, the, at the last half of tribulation happens. Are you with me so far? So these signs are actually really good for us. They're, they should be encouraging to us, right? We're still gonna pray, we're still gonna honor God, we're still gonna help where we can help, but, but what's going on now is prophetic, okay? So let's look at a couple more things. Turn over to 2 Timothy, I wanna show you this. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter three. A few more things that are going on in the earth that we can pay attention to. I want you to leave hopeful again. I always want you to leave hopeful. 
Come on, we should never be beat down by a message in church, right? Sometimes there's correction that comes and, and rebuke and exhortation. There's stuff that happens, it comes, but God's still on the throne, amen? So in, uh, in 2 Timothy 3, we'll start in verse one. It says this, but know this, that in the last days. Now, this word last is, is a, a Greek word. The word last is a Greek word. And it actually gives every indication uh, of, of the last part is the last destination. The last, it's actually, a, um, it's used a lot in this era as a nautical term. It's actually the last port. Like when you sail to that port, there's no more ports. You don't keep going. Like a while ago, they used to think you just, you know, fall right off the end of the earth, right? Th- this is, this is, definition of the last port is there's, there's not beyond that. You get there, you get your stuff, you come back. And so when he uses this last days, he's telling us, this is the end. This is the end of the travels, the end of the road. When you get to this point, there's no, there's nothing further. Pay attention to this. This is the last days. Perilous times will come. Perilous is another interesting Greek word because it is, it's like fierceness. It's, it's uh, pressure. It's, it's um, for some, it's terror. There's, there's a lot of darkness and evil and wickedness happening. Perilous days will come. And this word is only used twice in the New Testament. Right here, perilous times. And then the second time perilous is used is when it's describing uh, the fierceness of the madman of Gadara, the de- demoniac, the guy that's de- demon possessed. One uh, gospel version says one, another gospel version says there is actually two. These guys were full of de- demons. And it was, it was the, the word used perilous again is, is translated a different fierce, I believe, um, in, in a different sense, but it's the same Greek word, perilous times ahead perilous demoniacs. And the reason that word is used there is because they were, they were so well-known and so dangerous that people would not travel the road there. They had to find another way around. They would have to think, huh, well, how, how are we gonna get around this? How are we gonna circumnavigate this dangerous area so that we don't run into these perilous guys, right? So the same word is used right here. In the last days, at the last port, when you've reached the end, perilous days will come. And it says, for men will be lovers of themselves. Are we seeing that or what? It gives a picture of more than just selfie sticks. It means totally enamored with yourself and how you're portrayed and how you're perceived and what you're doing and how you feel, how you look. It, 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 when you break down this word, lovers of themselves actually is a, is a form of to kiss yourself. You just love yourself so much. Mm. this is the picture this greek word but i mean we laugh about this but this is what we see when we we flip on any kind of video or god forbid we have tiktok right i mean like anything you got right i mean this is what's going on in the world people are promoting themselves lovers of themselves lovers of money absolutely that's happening and it's love love of money is the root of all evil not money the love of money Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient. Blasphemers, in in this context, it doesn't just mean that you're saying something against God. Blaspheming is actually railing against truth. Blaspheming is actually railing against anything that's right and just, and you're saying, that's not right. That's actually also blasphemy. Blasphemers, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Despisers of good despisers of good. 210 congressmen in our country voted against a bill that would protect a child that survived an abortion and was birthed. They voted against care for a person. Despisers of good. Despisers of good. Come on, against all human decency. Are you with me? Are you hearing what I'm saying? I mean, we're not the only country doing this stuff. The, the, the U- European Union, the EU, they're ahead of us in many ways in a moral decline. Why? Because they kicked God out farther back than we did. They started rejecting God farther back than we did. Why? Th- that is an absolute recipe for disaster. The second you start pushing God out of your society, out of your, out of your culture, out of your government, out of how you do things, there's a decline. Come on now, we didn't do that. There's no decline in my life, thank you, Lord. But our nation did, and we've seen these things, haven't we? Europe did this before we did, and we've seen a decline. We've seen them 
promulgate all kinds of wickedness. We're thinking, what in the world are you guys doing over there? They're on the same path we're on. They're just farther down the track. And again, you're not going to leave sad. I promise you. I promise you. It has to go this way for the Antichrist to come to power. You understand that the Bible calls the Antichrist the lawless one. The lawless one. Well, you don't rule a people that are lawful when you're lawless. Are you listening? So there, there has to be lawlessness, like the Bible says, in the world for the Antichrist to rule the lawless. Are you? So, so what we're seeing shouldn't shake us. It should just make us more bold about who we are and going after people. Amen. Despisers of good, shocking, traitors, seen it? Headstrong, haughty, lovers of ple pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people turn away. Now, let me jump into Romans real quick. Let me read you this. Romans, this is an interesting verse to pull in right here. Romans 1 verse 20 says this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. He's talking, this is talking about God. From the creation of the world, his, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are not made. Or sorry, that are made. <laughs> I'm reading this. Stay with me. I can read. I can read. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Listen, verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. They weren't thankful. But became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Listen to me. We said this last week. You need to hear it again. 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Come on, there was an era there when we, until we got into the 60s and we had a, a renaissance, a rebellion, right? Against the man. We're still paying for that. Yeah. That rebellion of the 60s, we're still paying for that. That was a, an eradication and a rejection of the things of God and to push him out. But in the 40s and 50s and early 60s, come on, God was prevalent everywhere. And, the, and it wasn't that everyone was a Christian. I'm not so naive to believe these things. But there was a sense of in this country that there is a God and I'm not him. And, 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 and there were conversations. I mean, come on, you can read books and autobiographies. There was a sense that even the godless would pause for a moment of silence. Even the godless would say one nation under God. Even the godless would take their hat off and pray at a game. Are you following me? Even the godless would recognize I'm, I'm, I'm messed up. I'm not fixing it, but I'm messed up. Are, are you hearing? And there was a sense there that... that and, and, this word knew, it's, it's past tense. They knew God. There's a, it, it's talking to where we're at now and they're saying there, there was a people that knew God. They knew of him, they knew about him, they knew something's going on with him. They get to a place where they didn't glorify God nor were thankful and they became futile in their thoughts. Why? The beginning of wisdom is the fear and the righteousness of God. That's the beginning, the beginning. So when you stop to fear God, you stop that, you become futile in your thoughts. Another version says vain. Why? You're just thinking about you. It's thinking about what you can do and how you can get it done and what you can accomplish and who you can step on to get there. Are we seeing that or what? I mean, this has been prevalent for a long time, but now we're seeing it on mass scales. They become futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were darkened. We're in an era where people don't even see the right and wrong anymore. They have darkened their hearts. They don't fear God. They don't honor God. They don't even acknowledge he exists. And because of that, even though they think they're smart, the Bible says they're actually foolish in their hearts. And I'm not saying unbelievers are imbeciles. They're some very intelligent people that don't honor God. But the beginning of actual wisdom that produces something is the fear of the Lord. Now you see this in nations, in Europe, and then over here. But when we started, we honored God. And I'm not saying everybody, but a vast majority of the people that moved here, moved here because they wanted religious freedom. They didn't want to be at the state church anymore, being told what they can and cannot do and what they can read and can't read, right? They, that's why there was a mass growth in our country, but we honored God. And, the, and because of that, we became a nation that others feared. We became a nation that was powerful and, and um, wealthy and resourced. Are you hearing me? 
And, and people look to us for innovation and ideas. And since we have pushed God out, there has been this slip, this decline. This is, this is biblical. This is what happens when you reject God. And it doesn't have to be everybody in the nation. It just has to be the people that we put in charge. Get to the fun part, preacher. Come on, hurry up. <laughs> so if you skip down in, in Timothy there, we read about what's gonna happen. Skip down to the, the, the end of the chapter. 2 Timothy 3, 16. It says this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The, the word of God is bookmarked in this scripture where he's talking about what's gonna happen, how it's gonna get wild and crazy, and then how we hold on to our sanity all the way through it. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. It's the word of God that's, that's good. It's inspiration from God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, reproof is, come on, tweaking you, getting you right, corrections when you're way wrong and he's getting you back on track, for instruction in righteousness. It's, it's the a word of God that we allow to penetrate our lives and dictate our choices, our actions, what, what we say and do. Right. It's the word of God. That's why he says you gotta be a doer of the word of God. That's where the blessing comes. Not a hearer only, a doer. Everybody say a doer. a doer. Come on, you gotta be a doer of the word of God. That's how you get through this unscathed with, with a sound mind. Right, enjoying your heart. It's not gonna come just because you were here this Sunday. It's gonna come because you're a doer of the word. Right. You take time to put it in you. You take time to read it and, and understand it. Has anybody heard of Tucker Carlson? The more you hear him talk, the more you, he keeps, he keeps quoting New Testament scripture yeah. in his speeches. It's amazing to me, why? He's reading it for the first time. He's, he's very open about being raised Episcopal. He's like, we just did church as a, as a ritual, as a routine. But he's, now he's like reading the Bible. And he's like, there's so much good stuff in here. Yeah. I mean, Joe Rogan got caught reading the Bible on his show. Come on, this is, these, are, these are amazing days we're living in right now. It's the word of God that brings correction and reproof and instruction and righteousness. It's the word of God. And that's what it says, that the man of God, come on, that's mankind. Ladies, you're not left out. Stay with me may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Again, thoroughly equipped is another nautical term in the Greek. And we just look at it being just prepared for everything. But he's actually referencing back to the very first verse when he said, the last port, the last place you can get to in a nautical term, the last port, he references back here, being thoroughly equipped is a nautical description in the Greek of a boat that is ready for sea. Because you can have a boat with no motor, no rudder, no oars, no sail. How far are you going to go? <laughs> right? But if you get, you get that same boat and you put a 300 horsepower Johnson on the back of it, come on now. And you got a rudder and you got decking and you got stuff to weather the storm and, and the water and waves will come off. And right, if the motor goes down, you got a mast and a sail and you're, you're thoroughly equipped. You can get to where you're supposed to go. That's what he's saying. When you've got the word of God in you, you are thoroughly equipped. You're not just in a boat going, come on, come on, kids, put your back into it. <laughs> You're in a thoroughly equipped boat to handle the weather, what comes to get through to your destination. It's the word of God that brings us back to this place. This is what we have to have. If you're not spending time in the word, you're missing out. You're in a boat without oars and a sail and a motor. And you might get bumped around a little bit and you might be floating for a little bit, but you're gonna end up back where you started, pushed back to shore. Are you guys okay with this? He's helping us to understand it's the word of God that keeps us from these things. He's helping us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 uh, gives us a term called caught up. It's the catching away, the rapture of the church. And, the, and the, the term that's used there when he says that he's, gonna, he's gonna catch us, he's gonna grab us up, is a term in the Greek that's, that's called, it's, uh, it, it gives the connotation of to seize, to grab just in the nick of time, right? 
Uh, do I got any parents in here that have ever watched any kind of a cartoon before in a movie, right? <laughs> Almost all of them at some point, right? Uh, 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 the, the heroine or the hero, right, is on the precipice. They're on the, they're on the edge. They're on the, the very legend and they're about to get taken out and then something snatches them, something grabs them. They, they fall and they're caught, right? It's this, it's this picture, this idea that right before it looks like we're, we're, we're just, we're all going over the cliff. We're caught out of here. And so this gives credence to where we're at right now with Jesus not coming back already. Because I believe he missed a marvelous opportunity this month. I mean, it was just, the weather weather was not, I mean, but he knows exactly what he's doing, doesn't he? And, And when we keep going and we keep following what he's telling us to do and we keep putting the word of God in us so we're thoroughly equipped, we keep doing that. We keep seeing things in scripture and he shows us, I feel like, there could be a little bit more pressure before we see Jesus come back. I, I, feel like, I feel like in our country even, there could be a little more squeeze, a little more pressure on the things of God, a little more pressure on the people of God to do what's right, to separate the chaff from the wheat. You know what I'm talking about? To separate the hay from the sticks, to separate the parable of the virgins, right? There's 10 virgins and they're waiting for the bridegroom and, and he comes at midnight and five of them brought extra oil and five of them didn't, right? And the five that didn't had to go into town and try to fuck, where's the oil, where's the oil, where's the oil? The other five were ready to go. They just trimmed their wicks, added more oil. They went in with the bridegroom, the door was shut. I believe for us, I believe this is a picture of not 10 Christians and five made it and five didn't. I believe the 10 virgins is a picture of five Christians and five churchgoers. People that have appearance of a lamp. They have appearance of Christianity, they have, but there's nothing in them. There's no oil. They didn't bring any extra because they don't got it. Now they're trying to find it on the last moment. And that's a bad time to be looking for oil. So we gotta be Christians full of the spirit of God. Make sure we're, we're not just a church, but we know him. Because we know this from this parable and I won't take the time to read it, but we know this, that when they came and they sought to gain entrance, the master said, depart from me. I never, I never knew you. What does that tell you? They had a light. They had the appearance of it. No oil. Come on now, this church, Westside Church, come on now, we need to know Jesus. From the back to the front and side to side, we need to know him. So we come, come on, come on, come on, Vicky, come on, Tom. Come on, Eric, come on. We made it, come on, come on, come on. Are you hearing me? Yes. This is important. We need to know him. That's what the word will produce in our lives is the absolute assurance that we know him. Amen, he's coming back for us. Are you ready? Yeah. It's important we are. He's coming soon. I'm gonna spend a little time next week because I don't have time to go into the rest of these notes. But I'm telling you what, Jesus is coming back for the bride. He's coming back for his church. It's a glorious day. And it's gonna, it's gonna be a good time. But he is instructing us to pay attention to the season because we are not children of the night, we're children of the day. We don't walk around like, like those who are drunk, but we're sober in the daytime, seeing with our eyes what's coming. So that that day of the night doesn't overtake us as a thief right? Because it wasn't meant to overtake us as a thief. It's overtaking them, those that aren't following Jesus. So we're supposed to keep our head up and our eyes open, paying attention. I'm encouraging everyone here. Come on, develop your relationship with Jesus more than anything else. Your relationship with him will dictate your decisions. It'll dictate your actions. It'll dictate what you spend your time on. If he's real in your life, you'll spend time. If he's not, you'll find other things to do. If your marriage is important to you, right? You'll spend time with them. Yes? Come on, when you were dating, come on, we couldn't peel you off if we tried. Like every waking moment you had when you were dating your spouse, every waking moment you were over there working, eating, maybe, sleeping, maybe, but we're hanging out. I'm hanging out with a girl. Yeah, yeah. We're hanging out. We're having a good time, right? Relationship, you're building. Jesus wants that kind of intimacy with us. The waking, have you guys seen that meme where the guy, the, the title says, if we treated our Bibles like we treat our phones, right? And he wakes up and he's reading his Bible. And then he's eating his food. He's reading his Bible. He's, he's driving his car. He's reading his Bible. Hmm. I'm not telling you to do that, but I'm saying if we spent that much time in the Bible that we do on our phones, what kind of life would you have? Come on, we're talking about instruction for righteousness and equipped for every good work. Amen. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. Let's get into it. Can we do it? Let's pray. Father, thank you for helping us. Thank you for giving us wisdom and insight and excitement that Jesus is coming back. We're so grateful. Thank you for choosing us for this time. 
that we get to live in this hour to shine brightly for you, to bring people <clears throat> into the saving knowledge of Jesus, to preach the gospel, to set at liberty the captives, to cast out demons, to speak with new tongues. You called us for this hour, this time, this season. Lord, we want all of it that you have for us. We wanna experience all of it. Lead us, guide us, direct us, help us to hear from you like never before, to be in your word like never before, to see things we've never seen before, to walk things out. Thank you, Father. Thank you for giving, wisdom, giving us wisdom and grace to recognize the season and the time and to know you better than we ever have. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you're here this morning and you haven't made Jesus Lord of your life, this is the single greatest decision you'll make in your life. Single greatest. Not marrying your spouse, not having your kids, not picking a job. The single greatest decision you will make in your life is saying yes to Jesus. He is Savior. He is Lord. I'm telling you right now, he is the son of the living God. He came to the earth. He put himself in our place so that we could be right with God. He died for our sins. He descended into hell for three days and three nights. He paid the price and God raised him from the dead. And, and when God raised Jesus from the dead, he raised every single person that would say yes to him alive in Christ. So you have a choice this morning to say yes to him or no to him. This isn't a hang out in the middle and you can just be in limbo. This is you saying yes to Jesus. I will acknowledge you as my savior and my Lord. Or you're saying, no, I am not acknowledging you as my savior and my Lord. There's no gray area in this decision. So I'm giving you a chance this morning. If you're here this morning and you have not said yes to Jesus, you're not sure that you know him. You're not sure when he comes back that he would look at you and call your name and say, enter into the joy of your Lord. I know you, come in. If you're not sure of that, you need to be sure. And there's only one way to be sure, and that's to follow the, the path scripture lays out, to acknowledge in your heart and your life, to believe with every fiber of your being, he is the son of God, he did come to the earth, he did die for my sins, and God did raise him from the dead. And you're gonna believe that in your heart and you're gonna confess it with your mouth. That's the only way in, that's it. He made it simple, but he also made it profound. So if you're this morning, you haven't prayed that prayer, or you know, I need to recommit. I need to rededicate my heart to the Lord. I need to be right with him. I wanna hear, come in, I know you, from Jesus. If that's you this morning, we're gonna all pray this prayer together. All of us, we're gonna pray a prayer together, the whole church. But if you wanna be included in this prayer, while we pray it, you pray it out of your heart. If you wanna be included in that, I'm asking you, between you and me and Jesus, to slip your hand up where, you, where I can see it. Nobody's looking around, there's head bows, and I, just between you, me, and Jesus. I wanna see it. You wanna pray that prayer? I see that hand in anybody else. You wanna pray that prayer? Or you can cut your eyes up at me if I can see them. You wanna pray that prayer? Thank you, Lord. I'm looking around. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. God is good all the time. Calling on you, calling your heart. Thank you, Lord. I see those eyes. Anybody else? Come on, let's pray this prayer together. Let's mean it from our heart. Can we do that? Pray this prayer after me. Father God, I believe. Jesus is your is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And, he's your son. and he's your son. And he came to this earth. And he, this earth. And he died for my sins. And, for my sins. and you raised him from the dead. Him. Now Jesus, I'm asking you, Jesus, I'm asking you. Come, into come into my life and be my savior, be my savior. and my Lord. my Lord. Forgive me of all my sin. Me Make me brand new. Me brand new. Fill me with your peace, me with your joy and with the Holy Spirit. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God is good.